You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hey, everybody, Rick here. You've all heard me blathering on this year about my latest book, Cybersecurity First Principles, A Reboot of Strategy and Tactics. Well, we've turned it into an on-demand course featuring me, yours truly, as the instructor. I highlight what I think are the follow-on strategies to pursue the absolute cybersecurity first principle, which is reduce the probability of material impact due to a cyber event in the next three to five years. The follow-on strategies include zero trust, automation, resilience, intrusion kill chain prevention, and risk forecasting. I think it's the perfect quick-hitting content for busy security leaders like you and me, and it's all available now. Check out www.n2k.com slash first principles course, all one word. That's www.n2k.com slash first principles course. When you think about email encryption, what comes to mind? If you picture clunky legacy portals and feelings of frustration and rage, then you haven't met Virtue. Virtru makes it easy to protect sensitive emails and files that leave your organization, strengthening compliance with regulations like ITAR and CMMC. It integrates seamlessly with your daily apps like Gmail, Outlook, and Zendesk. See why Virtru has 36 number one rankings on G2. Get up to three months free at Virtru.com slash Cyberwire. That's V-I-R-T-R-U dot com slash Cyberwire. Hello, my name is Grace Cassie, and I am an early stage investor in cybersecurity companies. So I've always been interested in people and politics. I studied history at college, and I've always been fascinated by the interactions between people and getting into people's motivations and the context in which they operate and how that affects their decision making. So when I graduated, I joined the UK civil service and I went into our foreign service where I spent 10 years in a range of foreign policy and national security roles. I was really fortunate to be posted abroad quite early on in that career. So my early 20s, I went to Pakistan had a wonderful three years there and did a bunch of other roles in that time, including, uh, very fortunately, three years as a foreign policy advisor. So I had a huge range of subjects there which I was able to get involved in, everything from our policy towards Afghanistan to India to China to migration to uh, counter-proliferation and, you know, a real fantastic mix of subjects that I was able to to immerse myself in. So I left public service after 10 years, I think because I didn't want to find that I woke up, you know, 30 years into it and it was too late for me to try anything else. I'd always had a an interest in science and technology and I thought that I would step out and try to get into the technology world and, you know, really have a chance to work with with builders. You know, being a policy person is is great, but in some ways you're quite distanced from the people who are actually building stuff in the world. So I wanted to get closer to that. And uh, I started out um, working with and advising uh, growth stage technology companies across a whole range of subjects. So I worked with healthcare companies, energy tech, novel proteins, fintech. And that was fantastic. Worked with some wonderful, wonderful companies. But in terms of how I got into cybersecurity, it was a bit more of a roundabout journey, actually. I had been talking for some time with good friends uh, and colleagues in London about why we didn't see more high quality, scalable cybersecurity companies that emerged out of Europe. We felt that 
We had all the right ingredients here in terms of the talent, the problem set, the customers. And yet we didn't typically grow the number of high quality companies in security that we saw, for example, coming out of the US and, and Israel. And so my friends and I decided to set up an accelerator program for cybersecurity companies to try to create a kind of gathering point for a community, a program of support for founders taking on that really difficult challenge of building a deep tech business in security. So we founded Cylon in 2015 and worked with, gosh, upwards of 100 companies across Europe, Israel, and the Far East, because we also uh, latterly operated it out of Singapore as well. And that was where we really became uh, exposed to investing at the very, very early stage in, in young startups. So that's where I made that transition from being more an advisor to being more of an investor. So no one day is the same, which is probably why I enjoy it so much. And I get to meet a lot of wonderful people, which is the other reason why I enjoy it so much. Uh, but, a, you know, a day might include hearing a pitch from a new company that wants to seek investment for their solution. I hear a lot of pitches all the time, which I really enjoy. I might spend some time on the phone with companies that I've already invested in. Uh, obviously, we spend quite a bit of time doing that. Uh, I also spend quite a lot of time looking at policy developments in our in our sector, trying to stay on top of that and uh, hope that that also brings some perspective to the founders with whom I'm working. I've also happily managed to keep my hand in a little bit on, on foreign policy and international uh, policy. I'm a visiting fellow at Chatham House uh, in the UK, and that enables me to spend time talking to and thinking and writing about some of the geopolitical issues that affect uh, the security landscape. I would really encourage anyone with an interest in cybersecurity to consider a career in our space. I think there's a huge diversity of opportunities, both for people with a technical bent and for people who, you know, like myself, don't come from a technical background, but who are interested in people and motivations. And I think cybersecurity is a fantastic sector if that is your interest, because it really gets into the heart of decision making and um, how organisations can be constructed to, to best support a well-organized risk program and to work with with people rather than against them. I think it's a question of resilience and I think that can be developed as a personal skill set. I've been lucky in some ways to have worked in some quite challenging environments. You know, I was in Pakistan on 9-11 and for the period afterwards when uh, we, the Allied forces, went into Afghanistan. And so, you know, there in a, at Downing Street, when you work in a head of government office, there's obviously quite a lot of days where, where you're under high pressure. And I think that builds resilience. You start to appreciate that actually you, you can perform in those situations and you can appreciate the almost the enjoyable aspects of of working in in high pressure environments and there's a there's a real sense of achievement if you and your colleagues can can draw together and, and deliver in some of those situations so honestly i see challenging days or challenging times as an opportunity to build that sense of depth in your personal experience i would like to be remembered as someone who tried to have some impact. I think there's a lot of talking that goes on in the world and goodness knows I've done a fair amount of that myself. But I think if I could be seen as someone who really tried to make a difference for the companies in which I invested or for companies that I advised or for 
the industry as a whole. That would be very pleasing because I think probably don't need too many more words, but we definitely need a bit more action, including on things like uh, gender diversity, right? So I would really encourage anyone who is interested in people and has life experience to offer, which we all do, to give this industry a go because we need different voices and your voice would be very welcome. This episode of The Cyberwire is supported by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat discussing tech topics big, small, and strange. Compiler comes to you from the makers of Command Line Heroes and is hosted by Angela Andrews and Brent Simino. You know, one of the things I love about Compiler is the way they address issues that we're all thinking about uh, in a recent episode called The Great Stack Debate. They debate whether a software stack is like an onion, a sheet cake, or lasagna. That's the kind of metaphor I can get behind. If you're like me, you don't have a lot of time, and so you want to have a show that is concise and respects your time. And Compiler does just that. I hope you will check it out. Listen to Compiler in your favorite podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to Compiler for their support.